Good evening. I'm Jim Rumanier. I'm the, I'll be moderating this evening of debate and discussion. On behalf of the Sentinel, where for many years I served as editor, I thank Keene State College for making this venue possible and available. Large as it is, this hall could not accommodate all those who expressed an interest in attending, so we will be live streaming uh, the program on the Sentinel's Facebook page. This event will help introduce you to two candidates to succeed Kendall Lane as mayor of Keene who chose to step down after eight years in the position. The candidates are Mitch Greenwald and George, <laughs> and George Hansel. <laughs> Both are city councilors. They'll be asked questions by a panel that's comprised of Dan Mitchell, longtime radio host at WKBK. <laughs> Sierra Hubbard, a reporter at the Keene Sentinel. <laughs> and Casey Schmidlgagney, a Keene State College student who grew up in Keene. <laughs> the panelists will be asking questions of their own in addition to questions by members of the public that were sent to the Sentinel in advance of tonight's event. And members of the audience will also ask some questions. The arrangement is that in alternating fashion, a question will be posed to one of the candidates who will have up to two minutes to respond. Then the other candidate will have two minutes to comment, after which the first candidate will have one minute for rebuttal. Later in the evening, each candidate will have an opportunity to ask a question of the other. The evening will run 90 minutes with two five-minute intermissions. Those intermissions are for the benefit of the candidates, not necessarily for you in the audience, so I ask that you not mill around during those recess periods to assure that we can get back to work efficiently. You might use that time to respond to a survey that you were handed as you came in tonight. More about that at the first break at approximately 30 minutes in. Some of you in the audience might already have a favorite in this contest. But I ask that you curb your vocal enthusiasm so as to leave enough time for questions to be asked to the candidates and for the candidates to answer those questions. Also regarding signs, I ask that you not hold them up high, but rather keep them in your lap, lest folks behind you can't see it or it might interrupt the Sentinel's uh, streaming. In the interest of disclosure, I serve on the board of a local nonprofit uh, with George Hansel, but I don't see that as having any bearing on my role here. A few words here about the mayor's position. The mayor serves a two-year term. The mayor works with a 15-member city council and also the city manager who oversees a full-time municipal workforce of 235 full-time staff and 160 part-time and seasonal workers. The mayor presides over city council meetings, appoints councilors to committees, and also appoints about 200 citizens to 25 boards and commissions. For all this, the mayor has paid an annual salary of $4,000. So let's get on with the evening. We'll start, <laughs> that's somewhat below minimum wage. <laughs> we'll start with opening statements by the candidates. Uh, by the flip of a coin, Councillor Hansel will go first. All right, well thank you, Jim. Thank you to the Keene Sentinel, to our panelists, and of course to Councillor Greenwald for doing this, and thank you everybody out in the crowd. I can't really see your faces, but I know that you're out there and I know that it's friends and neighbors that are here tonight. My name's George Hansel. I wanna be your mayor. I've been a city councilor for four years now. And in that time, I've led some progressive changes. I've tried to reorient our city towards economic development. I've taken fiscal responsibility seriously and I've tried to move us forward. The same old steady as she goes just simply won't do anymore. We're in a very competitive environment, competitive for people, for businesses, and for resources. And that requires proactive change. We need to work hard to make sure that we're getting our fair share from the state. I've done that as a University System Board of Trustees member, as a member of the Governor's Millennial Advisory Council, and pretty much any other forum or table that I can get to I've gotten to. All trying to bring more back to this area 
where we don't get enough attention. I think that's a role that the mayor could take and maybe hasn't taken as much in recent years, but it's absolutely vital. We need to attract young people and especially young families here. Our future literally depends on it. So I want to thank you very much for coming again. This is going to be a fun night, I think, trying to get amped up for it. And uh, my name's George Hansel again. I'd appreciate your vote on November 5th. Thank you. Councilor Greenwald. Thank you, Jim. <clears throat> I want to say thank you to the Keene Sentinel. I want to say thank you to Keene State. Thank you to our moderator, our panel of uh, inquisitors, <laughs> and of course to Councilor Hansel. What a great night this is for Keene State College. One night, this auditorium is filled with people that are interested in the mayoral race. On the other side of town, there's a national political figure here at Keene State College. This is bringing positive press to the city of Keene and Keene State College. I'm Mitch Greenwald. I'm a candidate for mayor. I'm not a big time politician. This is my first attempt at debating. I'm gonna call it a forum just so I feel a little more easy about this. Uh, and I'm here, <clears throat> I wanna share my ideas. I wanna hear also from Councilor Hansel. I'm in this because I want to serve the city I love. It's not about status, and as uh, the moderator pointed out, it's certainly not about money. I'm not in it for future office. Generally, uh, I'm a very private person. I'm the kind of person that works behind the scenes, and if anything, this campaign has maybe brought me out a bit. I'm uncomfortable with all the, what I've done, what I've done. I just do it. My goal is to maintain the fine quality of life that we have here in Keene, I want to maintain the quality services and at the same time minimize the property tax impact. We'll be talking about expanding the tax base. We'll be talking about how to go about doing that. So I won't go over it now because I'm sure that the questions are going to pick it up. And I, as we're talking about the future, I also want to make it very clear I've been doing this for 24 years. I know how to do this job. I'm ready to step up and become the mayor of your city. Thank you. Thank you, counselors. Now on to the questioning. Dan Mitchell will have the open question. Thank you, Jim, and thank you uh, both George and Mitch for being here this evening, and to all of you, we appreciate you being here. Uh, we knew that in your opening statements you would answer the first question that we usually ask, which is why do you want to be mayor? I wanted to have you talk a little bit about the role of mayor. Why, what would you role, how do you view the role of mayor? And as mayor, how can you be more effective than what you do now as city councilors. You're both city councilors. How could you be more effective as mayor? Who's up first? Well, thank you for the question. Yeah, so section 19 of the charter actually only outlines a few specific powers for the mayor. Um, and that is to preside over the meetings, obviously. Uh, you're the official head for ceremonial purposes and you, um, you can uh, request reconsideration of a previous vote. But the mayor's ro role can be much, much more than that. And it has to be in these times. So the mayor can be an effective figurehead for, our, for Keene outside of our borders, can negotiate with the state department heads, can advocate for our needs. Getting to the table is key. And I've been able to do that as a city councilor. Those efforts will be enhanced when I'm mayor. We need to be working on keen specific solutions. And an example I'll give you is housing. Housing in the state is all focused on large housing developments, providing affordable housing for workforce. Large housing developments and all of the money, all the dollars that go towards housing are devoted towards that. Keen is different. We have older housing stock and we need to figure out creative keen ways to access that funding and bring it down to a single or two family home. So one of my other roles is I'm the board chair for Monadnock Economic Development Corporation, and we work on large development projects, large commercial development projects. We need to take that same model, the way that we look at a large project, taking multiple different 
um, different funding mechanisms and funding streams to make the project go, we need to bring that down to a small level. Single and two family homes, that's what's gonna help Keene, and housing is a key to so many different things. Thank you. Councilor Greenwald, you have two minutes to comment. Okay, thank you. I have a very different view of the mayor from what other mayors have, uh, ha have exhibited. And I would point out that I've served under quite a few going from Mayor Lynch, uh, Pat Russell, who I hold in the highest possible esteem, Mike Glastos, uh, Dale Pregent, and Kendall Lane. My view is that the mayor is the coordinator. He's the communicator. He, he has the ability to work with the 15 city councilors and bring out the best in them. We have 15 individuals, and they're all elected for different reasons with different agendas, and I want to hear them all. I never want to shut someone out or marginalize them from a conversation. I want a spirited discussion, and I can remember back in the days of Pat Russell, there were some really, really hot conversations going on, and that had a lot to do with why we have Blackbrook Industrial Park now. We, it, we achieved quite a bit through the aggressive conversation and debate, and I think that's very important. I also want to be working not just with the counselors, I want to be working with the surrounding towns, I want to be working with the county, I want to be working with the school board, so that we are all working to accomplish what this city needs. We need to go forward, we need to prosper, we need to work with our state representatives, our state senator, our, uh, the uh, representatives uh, and carry that message uh, further to Concord. So I will be looking to really get the best out of everyone and I left out one very important uh, component of this. I want to hear from you all. I want to be accessible to the general public and listen to what's on your mind so I can bring it forth through the City Council to achieve your goals. Thank you. you have a Councilor Hansel has a one minute rebuttal. So there's an important uh, official duty of the mayor that hasn't been mentioned so far, and that's appointing boards and commissions. Look around the city council table. Look at some of the boards and commissions that are there. It's not nearly as diverse as it really should be. And the next mayor, whoever it is, is gonna have a real challenge to try and broaden out and ask people to get involved in city government. Most city councilors start out on a city committee or a commission. To get on that, you have to know about it. You have to be asked. And it'll be a goal of mine when I'm mayor to reach out to people of diverse backgrounds. So hopefully when I leave city government in several years, it'll be a much, a much different uh, group of representatives than it is now. Thank you. Sierra, your question. Thank you, and thank you both for being here tonight. Uh, so this question comes from one of our readers who points out in, that in 2018, Keene had the fourth highest tax rate in the state. Roads are poor and the city doesn't even provide for garbage collection, this person says. So what are we getting for having such a high tax rate in the city? Councilor Greenwald, you're first okay, this time. Thank you. The goal is the balance of quality services and not overcharging. Uh, we have a limited source of funds. It's unlikely that any of us are going to be seeing a a broad-based tax, uh, be it sales or income tax, so it all falls back on, on the uh, property taxes. We as the city council have to carefully make the decisions, what are the priorities, and not let the spending get out of control or we're just going to drive people out of town. We need to broaden the tax base and to do that, we need to attract new industry, we need to work with our existing industry so that they can grow and expand, so that they can hire more people, we need to work with the industry to make sure that they are paying living wage. Certainly we need to, at some point, be raising the minimum wage so that people that are working at the bottom end of, of, of the wage scale are protected. What do we need to do beyond that? Uh, we, we need to just keep growing. We need to be collaborating with the surrounding towns. There's a lot of savings that are potentially possible if we work with the surrounding towns, sharing fire, police, and public works activities. Thank you. You have two minutes. So when I got on the city council four years ago, we had a spending problem. Our debt load was way outside of our fiscal policies. Um, and frankly, Councillor Greenwald had, has been chair of the finance committee for eight years. The taxes have gone up essentially every year. We need to focus on housing. 
Housing's 57% of our tax base. 57% of our tax base comes from housing, yet we spend no time looking at it. We need to get our arms around this issue, make sure that the housing is performing well, that the valuations are going up. And obviously, we have to recruit new businesses and allow businesses here to grow. So if you look around the total valuations for Keene, that's our, our total assessed value, compared to other cities and towns in the state of comparable size, Keene is almost flat or negative, chugging along even a slow decline. That's a big problem because other parts of the state on the eastern side, their property values are raising by 4 to 7 percent a year. That's one half of our property tax rate equation, and it can't stand. We have to focus on raising property values, figuring out how to increase the value of this housing, increase good paying jobs, and making this place a desirable place to live, a more desirable place to live. It's key. But we also have to look at our spending. I was amazed when I got on the city council that we had no high level fiscal goals that we could then drive our chief ex executive to achieve. They didn't exist. We had fiscal policies. We didn't have any fiscal goals. That's an accountability issue. When I'm mayor, we'll come up with fiscal goals. It may relate to spending a little bit. It may relate to our debt load. And then we'll drive to meet those goals. I think that's a conversation that the city council has to have. And I'll lead that conversation as mayor. Councilor Greenwald, you, your one minute rebuttal. Not your honor. I'm sorry. That's a kind of a reflex of being a long-term city councilor. He refers to that. Uh, we have this fiscal policy that limits our spending and, and directs our city manager to develop a budget. And it's uh, directed towards the consumer price index. We also have, have got to honor wage contracts. We need to be paying people reasonably for the work they do. We have a very, very talented city staff and we need to uh, compensate them appropriately. We have had minimal, minimal increases in our spending. Bear in mind that the school district is the largest portion of your tax bill. So they need to pay attention also. They need to be coordinating with the city on their capital projects so that we're not double hitting them. The same with the county. Uh, we are changing the way that we're dealing with our capital improvements program. Uh, this is a long-term spending plan that we look at uh, annually. We will be reviewing it line by line every other year. On the off year, we will be dealing with strategy. We will be dealing with the fiscal planning that Council Hansel referred to. Thank you. Our next question comes from Susan Silk in the audience. She's a keen resident and retired high school career counselor. Yes, it's uh, coming your way. Thank you for giving me the opportunity this, me, for this, a question. Excuse me, this question will go first to uh, Councillor Hansel. Okay. First of all, before I begin, I would like to thank George and Mitch. I know them both by their first names. Thank you both for supporting my Ghost Dump program at Keene State. I know both of you believe in what that's all about. Um, so I just wanted to personally thank you. Okay, my question. As a retired high school career counselor locally, I witnessed firsthand how difficult it was to convince our graduates to remain local and to continue their education local. What can be done within our local post-secondary institutions to make it worthwhile for our young people to stay and be educated here and for those that decide to leave town, and that is what's going to happen too, what can be done to bring those students back here after to live and work? Thank you. Well, I got asked a question the other day that, that was interesting, and it was, what's Keene's biggest asset? And almost right off the bat, I said, Keene State College. It's absolutely true. That's what separates Keene from a lot of other places that are fighting for the same things that we are. Keene State is vital. And attracting and retaining those students attracting and retaining those graduates needs to be a priority of the next mayor and council. There are things we can do to do that. We need to enhance and encourage some of the small businesses on Main Street that are popping up from younger people, young entrepreneurs. And I've done that. I've done that over the last four years. When Ash Sheehan needed to expand his business, Odalay, and open up a new brewery, he ran into red tape. 
and he got in touch with me, and we, we contacted the state, and we figured out what he needed to get his problem solved in one day. And he had been working on it for two years. We need to enhance those businesses, encourage those entrepreneurs, and create this culture that's attractive to students and young people. I can't emphasize enough how important this is for Keene's future success. This is our future workforce. This is students for Keene State College to keep them viable and, and doing well. And we have to, we have to, we have to pay attention to it. The workforce development too, and thank you Susan for the question. Um, what you're doing with Go STEM and getting women, uh, young, young ladies and young women into the STEM fields is vital, vitally important. Linking up those things with the manufacturers that exist here, with the education institutions that are here now is also a top, top priority. So by clicking those things together, providing good opportunities for graduates and young people, uh, good synergies between the business community and the college, and creating that culture that's desirable, we'll be in good shape. Thank you. Councilor Greenwald. Thank you. Uh, it really comes down to quality of life, and we have the quality of life here. I want to just speak of my own family's experience. I have three grown children now. Uh, my son and daughter moved to the big city, uh, where I'm from originally. Uh, they, they lived and worked in New York, experienced the thrill of living in Brooklyn. I experienced everything that the, the city had to offer. And then when the time came to have a family, they started to think, where do they want to raise their kids? Where do they want to go? And they started to think, Keene's a pretty darn good place. Uh, it's a very welcoming community. We have a lot of things going on, and we have a lot more that will be going on. And they came back. And I have one more daughter that is uh, moving from New Jersey. She's in Stanford. She's moving closer. So, <laughs> but uh, I, I think this is a story that is very, very common. Uh, we have excellent education going on here. Keene State College is a fantastic asset, and it's coordinating very, very well now with Antioch University, with R River Valley Community College, and the Cheshire Career Center. So it makes a path from high school to trade school to, Keen, uh, to River Valley to Keene State. And that really encourages people to say, yes, we want you here. We need the activities that, that will also make it conducive, more than just bars. And I think that we are developing that. We're talking about the art and music uh, corridor. That will happen. In terms of employment, Industry needs to bring in interns and get them working. I have done this in my own business, and I, I know Phil Train has done it in theirs, and I think that's very, very valid. That shows that there is a future here in Keene and that we do want them. We need good quality housing, and that is in the works now. There are several new projects that are uh, about to be occupied, and that opens up the housing market for all these individuals to want to stay and live here. So I, I think we, we have a very good future. We just need to keep pushing forward. Yeah, and thank you for mentioning the Arts and Culture Corridor. That's a Monadnock Economic Development Corp-led initiative in partnership with the city that we're driving forward with right now. The possibilities for this are really exciting because part of the land is owned by Kane State College. The plan calls for a 15,000 square foot covered pavilion that could be used by Kane State College and members of the community. One of the things I've been struck with since I've been a trustee, meeting with students is the lack, of, um, the lack of intermingling between the college students and the community. It's something that has to change and something that this arts and culture corridor can really help us with. We need to accept in Keene that we are not just a town or a city with a college in it, but we are a college city. We're a college town. We need to embrace that. Thank you. Next question is from Casey Schmidl-Gagney. Thank you everyone for being here. Thank you both for you. coming out. Um, this question is based on one submitted by a Keene State College student, Colette Rinker. The relationship between the city and the college is important to both, as we were just talking about. How, as mayor, will you improve this relationship? Councilor Greenwell okay. first, yes. Okay, thank you. I'm a Keene State College graduate. I came here in 1970 and graduated in 1974. My wife has a master's degree here at Keene State College. I understand the college. It, this is a very, very different school from what it was in the 70s. 
This is a very high quality uh, educational opportunity for the students and I think they're really enjoying and exploiting that now. How do we uh, work the city with the college? I, I use the expression, I want to bring the city to the college and the college to the city. In my opening comment, I said, this is a great night for Keene State College. It's also a great night for the city. We're together here, and this is the way it should be. I think back to the, uh, the times when Dr. Yarosavich was, was the president of Keene State. We had meetings regularly uh, with the uh, upper staff of the college, so the city knew what was going on. We had some social events that was very important. Working with the students, uh, I had the privilege last week of speaking to a political science class. Very, very enlightening. I really enjoyed the questions, and they were sharp. They were really hit me with some, some good zingers and looking, looking for answers. It was a good warm-up for this evening. One of the things that they pointed out, uh, uh, one individual pointed out, is uh, when she's crossing the, the crosswalk, the attitude of some keen residents is very, very aggressive. And I hadn't really picked up on this, and so maybe this is just an echo going back to the days of the Pumpkin Fest and some of the bad memories that linger, but we've got to work on this, that this is not the Keene State College of the Pumpkin Fest craziness. And I would also say that that, that event was not the fault of Keene State College, it's that this became a party town for all of New England. Over here, meanwhile, downtown, the Pumpkin Fest was doing great. We need more events like this. We need the Steinway uh, demonstrations. We need the community seeing the value of what's going on here. Councilor Hensel. I'm working on it every day. I'm a member of the university system board. I regularly meet with Melinda Treadwell and, and uh, the people here at St Keene State College. I also regularly meet with the students. So I'm by far the youngest trustee on the university system board. I'm the only trustee that's been nominated or appointed to this, uh, this board from this region in 25 years. That's criminal. The representation matters, and I'm living and breathing it. Every day, I'm trying to broaden and deepen the relationship with Kane State College, and I'm just going to continue to do that as mayor. I think it's terrific that you're on that board, and I really hope, and I'm sure you will represent the city and the college very, very well. Remind, remind them that Kane State is part of the university system. This is not a saying or anything, it's a compliment. Uh, it's very important that we deal with the students themselves. Part of my business is housing college students. So I see them regularly, I interact with them, I see them studying, uh, I help them solve a menagerie of problems and, and issues. It's important that each one of us, when you see a student, you know, maybe it sounds a little corny, that you say hello to them. They may have their headphones on or something, but still react to them as people and say, we, we like that you're here. Back in the day, uh, when I was a student, I, I lived off campus, and it was very, very unusual. But I was welcomed into Keene, and I'm still here. So, <laughs> thank you. Dan, next question is yours. Thanks, Jim. Uh, partisanship. There has been a lot of focus and discussion on the amount of partisanship in this year's mayor's race, Democrats versus Republicans. Do you think it's good or bad for the election? And would you support a change to the city charter allowing for more transparency in the process, including candidates uh, needing to declare their party affiliation. Councilor Hensel, you're first on this. So it's really sad that the partisanship has seeped into our local elections. I think uh, for a lot of reasons it's sad. But one, it distracts us from the, from the main point. We need to come together as a rural community, advocating for ourselves, against a more urbanized area in the eastern part of the state. That's what we need to do. We need to advocate for ourselves better. The partisanship divides us. It divides us. And we really need to move beyond that. I would be supportive of more transparency in campaign finance. I think it's really important. I think it's important to know where the money is coming from and where it's going. But I'm not, not in favor of uh, removing the, the prohibition on partisanship from the city charter. It's just going to divide us. It's not going to be helpful. And we need to come together as people of Keene to advocate for ourselves and Keene issues. Thank you. I think the charter is fine as it is. There's no need to be declaring what party you are. You are who you are. 
And that's what I always try to uh, display. I answer the questions. I am 67 years old, I have gray hair, probably could use a little more exercise. Oh, and when somebody asks me, I answer the question, well, we are nonpartisan. We deal with uh, snow plowing, we deal with water and sewer. But you know, the mailers you send out say issues. differently. We deal with <laughs> We deal Thank with, you for your listening to the candidate speak. We deal with basic city issues. As I've been knocking on doors, within the first two questions, someone asked me, what, what am I? I answer the question. As I've tried to communicate with the public, I answer the question. That's all there is to it. The Sentinel has really made a big deal out of it and waved it around quite a bit and made it into more of an issue than it was. You could have just left it alone and, and go on. But fine, that's what it is. Campaign finance disclosure, absolutely. I have done it. I don't know that the other gentleman has done that. I've disclosed what has come in, what has gone out, and I said, absolutely, I've received no money from the Keene Democrats, the Cheshire Democrats, or New Hampshire Democrats, or for that matter, the Keene Republicans, or anyone else. No, that's it. Yeah. You know, what I'm hearing from the Mitch Greenwald tonight is much different than the way he's been acting in his campaign. Much different. And it's, it's, it's wrong. I don't know how you reconcile those two things. Look, I have, when I decided to run for mayor, I'm not naive. I knew that the, the political parties were going to be interested in this. I sent out a statement. I sent out a statement to both political parties, local and statewide. I said, this is a local election, nonpartisan election. I don't want your help, and I don't need it. I've spent $6,786 on my campaign. I've been outspent three to one. My roots are deeper than your pockets. And you can't buy this election. The next question, excuse me, next question now from Sierra to Councillor Greenwald. We've talked about it a little bit tonight about housing. Um, you've both mentioned it a bit. Um, Councillor Hansel, you've touched on it quite a bit. Um, but whether it be affordable housing, um, different needs for some of our older housing stock in the city. Um, if you're elected mayor to each of you, uh, what aspect of housing in particular would you try to make a priority for your two-year term? And what would you do about it that you feel would be different than your opponent? What was the end? Sorry? At the end. What would you do about that priority that you feel would make you stand out from your opponent? Okay. Who? You, you okay. first. Okay. That's right. Thank you. Very familiar with housing. Uh, that is my business as a real estate broker. The uh, existing housing stock needs improvement. We have quite a few new uh, housing units that are coming online. The project on Roxbury Street, the Colony Mill Market, uh, what used to be the Colony Mill Marketplace. Hillside uh, development has taken a lot of housing and new people coming in. What we need to do is improve the existing housing stock. Keene State population has decreased. Students are living on campus more than off campus, and all those housing units are now available for, for, uh, for rent. Rents are going down. We need to work with the landlords and property owners to improve the existing housing. How do we do this? I want to explore programs that might be available through Southwest Community Services for res uh, residential insulation. I want to explore other programs that might be available to assist uh, la landlords and property owners to improve their housing. I also want to work with the 15 city councilors. We have ward councilors. Let's work within our wards to develop neighborhood groups to work within the, the streets to encourage more housing improvement, work person to person and assist like a community that we are. So housing is drastically important. And we haven't paid attention to it hardly at all. We, the, one of the first things I'll do as mayor is appoint a committee to study the housing issue and make sure that the current housing stock matches the needs of the people that are here and the needs of the people we're trying to attract. 
I've been working for the last year or so on an expanded weatherization and renovation program in conjunction with Southwestern Community Services. This is doing exactly what I mentioned in my opening taking some of that funding that's available for housing in the state of New Hampshire and bringing it down to a two or single, a single or double family home. That's what we have to do. Uniquely in Keene, we have a lot of old housing stock. Improving it will get us towards our sustainability and renewable energy goals, but it'll also help open up options for workforce, which is a huge issue. Councilor Greenwald, one minute. Thank you. The uh, existing housing is dreadfully not energy efficient. Southwest Community Services does have programs. Even Home Depot has programs. Our inspections department has the ability to work with homeowners and property owners when they're coming in for projects and encourage them how to be more energy efficient. We need to make that a priority for the code enforcement community development area to be working with the property owners and encouraging what needs to be done. And then the neighborhoods get improved and everyone uh, prospers and has a better living environment. Thank you. At this point, we'll take a five-minute break. These gentlemen have been in the lights for uh, 30 minutes. Give them a break. And I had asked um, that you stay as close to your seats or in your seats as you can, um, just so we can get back to this uh, once the break is over. Meanwhile, on your way in, you are presented with a survey that's uh, been drafted by the Sentinel that would be of help to the Sentinel. And uh, if you're so inclined, you can fill out the paper versions or go online. And uh, the address is up here. If you can see it, it's sentinelsource.com forward slash debate. That will be of use to the editors of the newspaper as they go forward. So we'll start this up again in about five minutes.
Thank you. Could you... Uh, Welcome, you're coming, returning to your seats so we can uh, resume the, the evening. Thank you very much. We'll resume the, the questioning right now. The uh, next question is from Casey. Yeah. Um, sorry. Uh, the recent Keene City Ordinance raising the age to buy tobacco and nicotine from 18 to 21 was met with disdain from many Keene State students, as well as some local businesses who said that their businesses would be hurt as a result of the ordinance. What is your response to that? And do you feel that there is a place for further city restriction on e-cigarettes and vaping devices? The first respondent is uh, Councillor Hansel. Yeah, so there are, there are definitely health concerns related to vaping and smoking among, among youth. I voted against that ordinance because I thought that a piecemeal solution really wasn't the right one. We probably, if it's going to be taken up, it should be on the statewide basis uh, to be most effective. So. I voted for it, very, very much for it. I'm very concerned about health. I'm concerned about our youth. We need to take affirmative action on these things. I'm also very, very uh, proud to have been one of the sponsors of the ordinance that we had years ago. Dr. Bob Englund and I were the sponsors that eliminated smoking in restaurants. This is both for the, uh, the diner's health as well as the employees of the restaurant's health. We did this before the state was with it. We took a leadership role in Keene, and I was very, very proud to do this. And I also will be candid with you, as a result of my actions, I was banned from Lindy's and Timoleons for three months. They were that concerned. <laughs> but uh, Mayor Mike Blastos was a big proponent of it. At times you have to take a leadership role. Mike was there, and I, I would do the same thing. Mike owns a owned a restaurant, and he realized that it did have implications to him also, but he did the right thing for the people. The vaping, I don't know. Uh, you know, We see this all over the place, just how, how terrible this is. As, a potential health risk. So taking the position that we need to raise the age where it is legal to buy vaping products, realizing that they're going to drift downward into the high school, they're gonna drift downward into the middle school, pushing it back up to 21 at least gets it out of the high school. That, that is why I was there. Very, very proud that I was very firm on this. Yeah, so again, I think the mayor's role and the city council need to look at what the desired effect is and the most effective way to do it. So that's something that I would definitely refocus the city council and the mayor on. What is the effect? Is this potential legislation really going to affect the change that you're looking for? In this case, it was not. Stores right over the border um, could sell these products. Stores right in Keene could not. It wasn't going to keep any of these products out of the hands of youths. It was a statement, and it would have been better if we all bonded together and continued to push and advocate for it to be done on the statewide level. Thank you. Another question from the audience. This is from Sarah Wyron Rudy, who's a social studies and science teacher for grades five through eight at the Surrey Charter School in Keene. Thank you. This feels very powerful. <laughs> um, Mr. Greenwald, I'm glad to hear what you said about um, Keene being a leader or taking like a leadership position. Um, as a school teacher, my class is working extensively to convince Keene government to pass legislation for Keene to do away with single-use plastic bags. What do the candidates plan to do to address global climate change on a local level? First, yes, thank you. I got the letter from uh, your, one of your students. Fantastic uh, a project that your class is, is involved with, pointing out all the hazards of these single-use plastic bags. And probably most of you know this. This is what uh, the uh, food stores and Home Depot and such give you to carry out small, uh, small purchases. So your school is, is concerned with this issue. Our state legislature is a little slow on the uptick with this. So I wrote back to the student, I'd love to push it uh, further. 
I don't use plastic water bottles, you know, I'll use this. I'm kind of ambivalent about straws, but I guess that's something that, that is serious too. The plastic bags, and, and what I suggested was, let's take it one by one, bring it as a public relations issue, and the stores will, will go along with this and say, you don't really need that bag. A little display right by the cash register, urging people, don't take the bag. It's just that easy. It's not that complicated to carry out a couple of bottles of soda and whatever else you're buying if it's a small purchase. That's what I do. And if I'm online with someone, I'll ask that question. For us to uh, try to put legislation out uh, as a city, I don't think it would be very enforceable. I don't think Hannaford's and uh, Price Chopper would, would be dealing with, with us very affirmatively. Because there is the issue that if it turns into something that is expensive for them, it's too easy to go down the road to market basket. So I don't want to do something that's going to handicap the stores, but I think my solution will actually work if it's person to person as a public relations do the right thing. Councillor Hensel. I'm actually fine uh, banning the plastic bags and the, and the plastic straws. I think most businesses in the city have probably already taken steps in that direction because the city of Keene cares about the environment. We care about sustainability. And, you know, our initiative to move towards 100% renewable energy is an important one. Man-made climate change is real and the city needs to be investing and taking steps to mitigate it. And we are. The city has stepped up immensely in, in tackling it with an ESCO program, which reduced our energy load, saved the taxpayers millions of dollars. We've put solar panels um, up on the public works building. Again, a tax, saving taxpayers money and being good for the environment. We also need to take this further. We should be installing solar panels at the wastewater treatment plant. The wastewater treatment plant is the largest energy user in the county. And we need to install a solar system out there. The business community is doing it too. At Filtrain, we've, we're just about to flip the switch on the third largest rooftop installation, solar installation in the state, largest in the county. And this is in a long line of progressive, sustainable things that Filtrain has done and lots of other businesses in the community. So we need to continue to do that. It's right that the city invest in these things and we, whoever's mayor needs to put the hammer down on it. Yeah. Councilor Greenwald. Uh, thank you. Uh, the city needs to continue leading by example. I was on the council when we had the discussion regarding the, the ESCO uh, project. And what that did was it reviewed all the energy use around the city. Everything from the boilers to the insulation to the windows, even down to the minutia of the light in the soda machine. And they pointed out uh, that that is a waste of energy. I could have figured that out for myself. Uh, put up solar panels by example, leading by example. Uh, one of my buildings, and, and it's interesting that Phil Train is about to throw the switch. We are about to throw a switch, too. Uh, my building on Emerald Street, uh, we, we have a solar array that is on the entire building. This will supply the electricity to all, all the residents, the offices, and the laundromat. It has a payback period of two and a half years. It's a fantastic project. There are uh, some state pro uh, 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 subsidy programs, Eversource participates, and this is leading by example. The guy down the street, Toby Towsley, did it on his building. He's a smart guy. I'm doing it on my building. Roger uh, at Good Fortune is considering it for his building, and it goes one by one. It's leading by example, and I think that's very important. The city has got to stay, stay out there, and as George said, no matter which of us uh, makes it to the finish line, I think we're going to be energy conscious. The next question. Uh, do I get a rebuttal now? I think I started, right? Okay, that's right. I'm sorry. So, I disagree with Mitch on this, that, that leading by example is just not enough. We need to see going down this path of sustainability and renewable energy as an opportunity, not just an obligation. And we can do that in a lot of ways. A lot of companies that are here now are related to the sustainability field. We're building sustainable projects products, and we're all very conscious of this. I started a group here in Keene called the Keene Manufacturers Consortium. We get together monthly, it has all the largest um, manufacturers in town, and we talk about these issues. And one, of the, it, one of the really interesting things is when I started this group, I didn't go into it with preconceived notions. I didn't know what was really gonna come out and float to the top as far as issues we wanted to tackle. Workforce was certainly number one, but sustainability and renewable energy was a close number two. And that's really hopeful. It's an opportunity for Keene to seize. 
Thank you. Dan, your question. Uh, this question, uh, thank you. This question was submitted by one of the Keene Sentinel uh, readers, and they wanted to ask about infrastructure needs. Uh, the question is, I believe that tax dollars should be invested in improving the safety and livability of our city. To that end, what will you do to ensure that roads and bridges are properly cared for? Is there currently a plan to review road conditions and plan of improvement, especially in the downtown area where many roads are in serious need of improvements now? Well, I think I've taken this out of order, so which one wants to start? <laughs> I'll start. Go ahead. So, when I got to the city council, we did have a spending problem, and it was related to that debt issue. We're still bonding a lot for road maintenance, and we need to, we need to pay attention to that. In my experience as a manufacturer, you can't spend more than you're bringing in. That's certainly true. But what has happened in the four years since I've been on council, actually as, a, as an initiative led by the staff, who are very, very talented, we've started managing our roads and bridges as asset, assets. So they are taking a look, um, look at the road condition, and we are making strategic investments in how to improve the roads. I think whoever's mayor uh, really needs to just continue along that road and keep giving the staff what they need to do that. Not be re reactionary, we need to be proactive. And I think that's the, the posture that we have now. Part of our capital improvements program is that we lay out a plan for future road improvements. What roads get rebuilt, what roads get resurfaced, uh, what roads get curb and, and sidewalk so that we can plan intelligently for it. We recently started a, a new program where when we do a road rebuild, we also go back and do road maintenance on it. This way it will prolong the life of the road. It's unfortunate that asphalt does not last forever, it cracks. And in New England weather, it cracks faster than it does uh, in the Southland. But with this program, at least we're recoding, we're resealing, as you and I would do on our own driveways, and I think that's a really good plan. We need to deal with our traffic signals. It's been identified that traffic signals that used to be synchronized, say, along West Street, just don't work anymore. And this is gonna be a project coming up within the next capital improvements program, because we need to get new computerization going on. I always wonder, why don't we have flashing lights at night? You know, why are we making people stop needlessly at stoplights that the trip signals no longer work. So we need to review that. And as long as we're on the subject of roads, speed limits. Our speed limits are too high. You know, I'm sorry, our neighborhoods are on the edge of unsafe. I wanna see 25 miles an hour throughout the neighborhoods, 30 on the connecting streets. This shouldn't take a whole big uh, study and survey as what is in the works going on right now. Councilor uh, Richards and Bosley, brought forth this, this concept, it went in as a uh, discussion, and it turned into a major project for city staff. I want to see that turnaround, let's make it safe, keep it simple. Yeah. So the infrastructure has to be a high, high priority for the council and mayor, obviously. Um, we need to make sure that we're taking care of the roads, one of the problems we've been having is, is a workforce problem. So the lack of workforce in this area affects all different areas of the city and, uh, and not just the business community. But we're not getting as many bids for these road infrastructure projects as we need to make them really competitive anymore. The road paving companies are so busy in the greater region that we're having a hard time attracting attracting those companies to come and do our projects. This is a big, big problem, and I would say something that we should not just rely on the Public Works Department to figure out. We have to get our hands around how are we going to make our road and infrastructure projects competitive, and how are we gonna solve this problem of not having enough, uh, enough contractors to do this work? Because otherwise, our expenses are gonna go very, very high. You're seeing, you're seeing all of our road projects increasing in costs, and we need to get our arms around it. Back hey. again. Jim. Sure. Just very briefly, the road pavers and the road reconstruction companies, they're not local. This is a statewide problem. So getting these bids is difficult. One thing that has just boggled my mind is why we wait until the last month or two before the project is ready to go to go out for bid. 
and I brought it up, and I brought it up year after year, and other councillors have brought it up. As mayor, I think I'll have a much louder voice when I say, why don't we go out for bid earlier? And, and then we get a more competitive bid. When, when you bid at the last minute, and you all know this is what goes on with your home, home project, if the contractor knows that he's the only show in town, you're not going to get the most aggressive price. So I want to get out there and get these bids early. Thank you. Thank you. Yep. Dan, I believe you have the next question. I do. Thanks, Jim. Let's talk a little bit about uh, economic development initiatives. What are your plans to foster increased economic development in the city of Keene? Mitch. Me. Okay. Good. I just don't follow I'm sorry. your rhythm. It's okay. Uh, economic development has been identified as probably the biggest single issue that we're facing. I have chaired the Economic Development Committee, part one. I just completed the second one. This was an all-inclusive committee. We looked at everything uh, involving uh, what will it take to move us forward. We need to increase our tax base. We need more building. We need more jobs. Well, this is an all-encompassing issue. We need the workers, so we, we need the housing. We need the arts and entertainment to make the area more desirable to work at. We need to make the process more simple for the construction of projects that will increase the tax base. So it's, it really is like a, a multifaceted issue. This committee looked at all facets of it, including uh, high-speed internet, which is critically important for our future. Businesses, we're not, gonna, we're not gonna have a major highway system here, but we can compete on the information highway, as, as, as we call it. A lot of people work from home also, so to increase the ability of businesses to come, we need a better internet. We need to promote and support diversity. There's a lot of people that want to come to Keene and we could be attracting that workforce. I met with the CEO of the hospital and one of their major uh, it, uh, programs is as they're recruiting new doctors and new nursing staff is that there is diversity coming and we as a city need to really embrace that and encourage it, make everyone feel welcome. All are welcome here is got to be a very, very important line that we live with, not just something that we say. So. so our chances for recruiting a business really are going to come down to this. Our best chance of recruiting a new company, company to Keene is likely going to come from a 50 mile radius of where we're all sitting right now. And so in my point of view, it becomes a sales proposition at that point, not just a marketing proposition. We need to open up new sites, appropriate sites for development, and we need to match those sites with the appropriate business owners. I've been doing that through my work on the Manufacturers Consortium. I've been doing that on the state level, being involved with uh, New Hampshire Businesses for Social Responsibility. And that's that hand-to-hand -hand work that needs to take place that's really going to drive our economic development efforts. I want to bring three new businesses to Keene with about 50 employees apiece. I think that's manageable, and because of the size of our community, it's something that would make a tremendous, tremendous difference. And it's really going to be a sale. And the mayor has a tremendous capacity to do that. They can play that role. They, I have uh, good connections in the business community. I can, make those, I can go out and make those introductions, and I'm going to continue to do that as mayor. Councilor Greenwald. Yeah, thank you. Part, part of what being a real estate agent is, is selling, selling the community, selling why do you want to live here in Keene? And there are a lot of individuals that come in and out of my office that we're talking to and are thinking about locating businesses here. One of the things that they look at is uh, the airport. And that is a little, very much underutilized gem that we have. It's a great airport. That is a large reason why CNS Wholesale Grocers came here. I'm on the airport uh, marketing committee, as it's called now. It used to be the uh, uh, airport resources, or anyway, it, it's there to market the airport and, and be able to sell it to the outer community. We put out a request for a proposal for a, a new airport manager, which should be coming through, and we issued a request for a proposal for a marketing consultant who will look at. Do we, have, do we have a market here? Because Keene can be the feeder that is going to Teterboro and, and other airports. Or 
is our airport suitable for freight? Maybe that's another great way to do this, to expand. But it's all part of the economic development of the area. Use the airport, use downtown, use the college, and whether you call it marketing or selling, it basically is the same thing. We, can, we just have to bring the message out there. I want to see the city of Keene at trade shows in Boston talking about Keene. An event like this, Keene is on, like we are Thank here. Thank you, Councillor. Okay. Sorry. Good. There, there is a light system here that tells us how the long people are talking. <laughs> There, there are two important partners that haven't been talked about in regards to economic development. One is Keene State College, and the other, and for that matter, the other surrounding universities and colleges to provide the workforce. And the other one is the state. Interacting with the state for economic development is absolutely critical. Because any business that's going to move here from another state or, or really move is going to call the, the business and economic affairs department to see, uh, to feel that out we have to get a much better relationship, a much tighter relationship with those agencies. And that's been improving over the last couple of years. I remember going to an event um, where they were outlining the marketing for the state of New Hampshire. This was a couple of years ago. And we actually got serious about marketing the state of New Hampshire. They put together a whole slide deck and a whole thing on, on uh, what they were going to do to market us in Boston and other places. I sat through that meeting. I was one of the only people from the southwestern corner of New Hampshire. And I was waiting, I was waiting, I was waiting, and there wasn't one mention, picture, anything of the Monadnock region. Not one. I would have settled for a picture of Mount Monadnock. That would have been fine. You know, but not one. And that, that was striking to me. That's a problem. We're not going to be able to achieve our goals without the state's help. Thank you. Sierra, you're next. Thank you. Last winter, homeless shelters in Keene were at capacity for nearly the entire season. Aside from the ongoing land use code overhaul, which aims to address some of the zoning concerns of some nonprofit agencies, what new or additional steps would you take as mayor to tackle homelessness in the city? Councillor Hansel. So, 100 Nights and, and the other services that are, that are uh, serving the homeless it's in our best economic interest to support those agencies. Not so many people know this, but we have a legal, the city has a legal obligation to take care of the homeless and indigent. Those nonprofits, those organizations that are doing this are taking the burden off of taxpayers. So it's in our best interest to support them. 100 Nights needs a new home for a lot of reasons. And uh, Councillor Manwaring and I have really been the driving force behind getting some of the land use codes updated to allow for that move. They need a new home. It needs to be within close proximity to downtown, probably not right on Main Street, but that's something we have to get done because it expresses the values of this community. We believe in personal dignity, and we're going to take care of our people when I'm mayor. Obviously, the issue of homelessness is not simple. If it was, it would have been solved long ago. We have excellent shelters that Southwest uh, Community Services uh, runs. 100 Night Shelter does a fantastic job. And if anyone doesn't know, it's not 100 Nights. They are functional all the time. There are families in need. There, there are families with children living there. I, I go over there, I see the folks, uh, it's right outside my office, I talk to them. They are people, and we need to treat them as people with dignity. It could happen to anyone. Situations change and you could find yourself homeless. Now, one of the other issues with homelessness is the substance abuse issue, uh, opioids and other substances. We need programs to work with these people to rebuild their lives. One of the shortfallings of, of the 100 Nights program is they don't have enough of these counselors. So what I want to do is I want to have a standing ad hoc committee that will deal with homelessness, another one that will deal with opioids and substance abuse. We need to treat them as, as people. They're not talking points. We need to say hello to them even, you know, reach out and talk to them because they are people. I will, I will do it and I'm sure George will do it also. Thank you. I've, I've sat on a lot of committees, and they're not going to get the job done. 
Having a committee is good for coming up with plans that then they get executed by people on the ground. We need to execute those plans. I've gone into the Serenity Center um, yes. throughout this campaign, which is a great organization, and I asked everyone in there, what's the one thing that the mayor of Keene could do for you to help your organization and the people you serve? And without a doubt, it was more sober living facilities. That was the number one answer. So that would, I, I listened, I'm taking that, and we are going to create the opportunity for more sober living facilities in Keene. Because anyone who wants to improve their life, we need to give them that opportunity. I don't want to live in a community that doesn't. Thank you. At this point, we'll take that second uh, five-minute break. Oh. Well, that was fast. <laughs>
Shall we get back to uh, get back to our chairs? Thank you. You're an extremely uh, responsive audience. Our next question for the candidates will come from Sierra. Yes. To uh, Councillor Greenwald. Hello. Yes. Keeping in mind proposals like the Arts Corridor and uh, the Downtown Revitalization Initiative, how do you balance these projects with uh, the concept of lowering our property taxes while also keeping in mind that you want to try to include uh, residents and business owners who live outside of the downtown footprint? Okay. Downtown is the heart of the city. I have lived through two downtown rebuildings. Uh, obviously, I own property and my office is on Main Street. Our infrastructure, as it's called, the water, the sewer, drainage, is decaying. I've had pipes replaced that were cracked, full of roots. It needs to be replaced. We have the opportunity when the street is being dug up to put it down in whatever fashion we want, so we have the opportunity to make it more suitable for for the current times and the future. The last rebuilding is what took away the green concrete, for those of you that remember the 1970s, and brought in trees and the nice parking, uh, parking uh, planting areas. Now we have a lot of downtown restaurants that have outdoor seating. And I'm happy to say that I was one of the pioneers in pushing that, uh, making it permissible to have outdoor seating in restaurants. So as downtown needs to be improved, we have the opportunity to improve it the way that we want it. The art and the music corridor is a great idea. Very, very enthused about it. I have some serious concerns. And one of the concerns that, that has not been addressed, but I, I'm positive on it and I'm supportive of it, but I want to hear about traffic flow, where are the, where are the cars going to park, and who's going to pay for this. It's a great idea, and I think it's going to help us uh, going forward, attracting new, new people to Keene, and making this a really exciting, desirable place to, to live and work. But I want to know the dollars of it. I don't want this to turn into something that's going to be vastly expensive for the taxpayers. When going in, we're being told that there's subsidy money and there's all kinds of great programs that are going to make it happen. But I want to be convinced that going forward into the future, it's not going to cost you money to maintain it. We need to utilize public-private partnerships whenever possible. This reduces the impact to the taxpayer, and it's a great opportunity to partner with other organizations and private industry to make things happen. That's how the Arts and Culture Corridor is going to move forward, through a triple P. And uh, it's vitally important. We need to make downtown an active hive of activity, because that's what the young people and the young families we're trying to attract want. It's one of the boxes that they're going to check when they decide whether or not to live here. So we need to focus on the downtown. It's imperative. Another example of when we used a, a public-private partnership with, was with the downtown coordinator effort that I led through bringing together Mananak Economic Development Corporation, going out and beating the street and, and raising money from the private businesses, and then also bringing the city in to control, to contribute to that initiative. This is how we need to be thinking, and it's something that I uniquely bring to the role of mayor, utilizing strategic partnerships, being a bridge builder throughout the community, and building these coalitions around these ideas to get it done in a way that's reasonable and doesn't impact the taxpayer in a large way. The other thing we're gonna to have to look at is housing downtown. There's going to be increased pressure to build housing close to the downtown core. There is. Young millennials and young people, they want to live in a walkable community where they can work, recreate, and play in the same area. The big challenge for the next mayor and council is going to be how do we allow for that new development that's inevitably going to happen, but still maintain the look and feel and the things about downtown that we find really important. Frankly, this was one of the reasons I got into city government. I started out on the Conservation Commission seven years ago. And I was really interested in how these two seemingly opposed positions, new development and protect, protection of the environment and open spaces, intermingled. It's been a passion of mine, and I think it makes me uniquely suited to lead us through the next 10 years as things play out. 
The economic development coordinator is not a unique idea. We've had a downtown uh, director of different varieties over all the years that I've been downtown. It's always been a volunteer position. I'm very happy that this is a paid position. MEDC did step up, do their side. I'm happy that I was part of the city side of this through the budget to assure that the funding's there. And I want to make sure it stays there. It's not in jeopardy, but I want to make sure it's there. Also, I try to work very hard with this uh, downtown coordinator, giving her some direction in terms of what's going on downtown. What are the personalities and what do we need? Uh, the uh, city is also looking at the parking needs downtown. Very important because parking is not just about revenue, it's also about uh, driving, where do we want to have development, uh, what different uses are there downtown, is it about housing, is it about food, is it about retail. So it all has to work together and, and it will work together. We need to make a decision about a parking deck in the downtown core. I think it's ridiculous that Portsmouth and many other cities in New Hampshire are putting up 100% public parking decks. Portsmouth just put up its second, and Keene has not. This is gonna be really important, because as we grow, as the arts and culture corridor comes to fruition, and we're generating this activity, we're attracting people in to uh, take advantage of our artistic, our artists here and our culture here, we need a very visible place for them to go and park. And there are ways to do this, bringing a, a large entity downtown that could help us facilitate the, the construction of such a deck is a possibility. We need to explore it. When I'm mayor, we'll finally address and make a decision whether or not we're gonna do that downtown, and I think it can't come soon enough. Casey? All right, yeah. So uh, this question is also submitted by a student at Keene State, Ryan Meehan. Um, should Keene be a sanctuary city? If so, why? If not, why not? You're first. I hate to take the excuse of I need more information. I need to know the real definition of what sanctuary city means. Does that mean that the police uh, will uh, not report if there's a crime? I don't think that's, that's appropriate. But on the other hand, I don't want to see people uh, chased out of town. I don't want to see uh, people persecuted because they happen to look a little different. I believe in the all are welcome here. And our sheriff has put forth very, very clear guidelines on this. Uh, if there's a traffic stop, you deal with the traffic stop issue. You don't start digging into the person's immigration status. I, I don't think that's correct. On the other hand, I also don't want to be just putting a, you know, a blanket uh, uh, statement out there when I don't really understand, and I'll be in straight with you, I don't understand all the implications of Sanctuary City at this time. So I've talked to the police chief about this, and he's made it clear to me that um, enforcing immigration policy is not a priority for the department. Now there is a legal and appropriate separation between a local governing body such as a, a city council and a mayor from dictating to the police who and who not to arrest. That exists. So there is a line there. One thing I would say is if there was a directive for the federal government, from the federal government for our local police department to enforce those laws, I think there's a very clear argument that the mayor could make that we are not, that that would be an unfunded mandate. And it's not our job to do that. We need people here. And frankly, I don't care where they come from. I don't care what their background is. We need people, and especially people that are willing to fill in gaps in our workforce. So I would be all for um, attracting people here and using whatever means necessary to do that. Councilor Greenwald. I don't know, I, I guess I'm just thinking back to uh, my personal history and family history. Uh, my family was chased out of Hungary. Other relatives uh, had worse situation. I, I feel for people that are fleeing from situations that put their lives in jeopardy. I want to do whatever we can to assist. I certainly want to encourage uh, employers to hire people. I want to have a diverse community here. Uh, and again, I have to go back to the what what all the implications are of hanging the sanctuary city label on us.
before I say yes or no. Thank you. As noted at the outset, um, the next questions will come from the candidates themselves. Ooh, no. One candidate will ask a question, the other will have up to two minutes to respond, and then the questioner will have one minute for a rebuttal. Following the order of questioning to now, uh, Councillor Greenwald will ask the first question of Councillor Hansel. I didn't know that we reached the end of the evening. <laughs> okay, time flies. Okay, the preamble. I've been, a, I've been here for 49 years. I've built businesses. I've adapted to change. This, this, is, this is not the closing remarks. This is the... I know. Okay, I'm Coming sorry. Coming to a question. <laughs> Raised three kids, put, put them through keen schools. I work with people of all ages and backgrounds. George, you're a nice guy. Uh, you grew up not in Keene. You've been here a reasonable period of time, but you never attended Keene schools or Keene State College. You work in a professional manufacturing plant owned by your family. Mm -hmm. Hang out with young professionals and educated folks. How do you think you can understand the needs of the average people of all ages and backgrounds in Keene? So I worked my way up at Filtrine. I was coming to Keene when I was in high school. I worked in the shop. I worked in the stock room. I was putting together actually coolers for Krispy Kreme donut shops. Do you know what? Everybody knows Krispy Kreme donut shops. Well, when I was in high school, there were a lot of Krispy Kreme donut shops going up. And I was, uh, I was working in the shop floor and um, putting those things together. That's, um, that's been a great experience for me. But I also live on Elm Street. I live about two blocks north of Central Square in a duplex that I bought a few years ago. Uh, had to fix up a bit, and we're doing that. And I think I'm very in touch with the direction that the city of Keene is going. I'm living it as a young person here now, trying to make their community. That's valuable. I chose Keene, and I'm going to work my tail off to make sure that other people choose Keene too. You have a rebuttal for one minute? No, that's fine. <laughs> I think that was a good answer, George. Councillor Hansel, you can ask a, qu you can ask a question of uh, Councillor Greenwald. So, Councillor Greenwald, you've been a councillor for 20 year 24 years and chair of the Finance Committee for the last eight years, yet the tax rates have consistently gone up pretty much every year. How can voters trust you to make any sort of positive change when you've been part of the problem for the last quarter century? Okay, well, I don't consider that I'm part of the problem. I'm considering that there are 15 city councilors, of which you're one of them, who was at every one of the budget hearings, and we analyzed every line of it. And I only wish that we had a turnout like this talking to us at, at budget hearings, because we really don't hear enough. The answer to the question is we squeeze the budget. We make it as tight as we can to provide the services, and we have the direction to keep the increase in spending to the cost of living. And that really puts us at a, at a real disadvantage as, as prices are going up and we're also just trying to keep up. So everyone wants more roads, we want better roads, but the prices are going up and we're just trying to squeeze the same dollar. I will continue to watch the budget because basically I'm a taxpayer, you're a taxpayer. I watch it because it's my money as well as your money. I continue to do it, but I also want, going forward into the future, there are 15 city councilors, and it's just staggering, staggering how few actually show up at the budget hearings, how few actually speak at the budget hearings. And one of the things that I will do is I'm going to draw them into the conversation. I want to hear some arguments. I don't want 15 to nothing votes, and especially on the budget, but let's, let's really get it on. If you have any ideas on where to save money, I'll listen. I'm all about communicating, and I want to hear. Doing the same thing over and over again, expecting a different result, is not going to get Keene where it needs to go. It's not going to get us where we need to go fiscally. It's not going to get us where we need to go in attracting the young people and young families we need. And we need fresh energy and new ideas if we're going to truly move the city forward where we all know it needs to be. 
We will now move to the closing remarks, two minutes each, by a prior arrangement from the flip up a coin uh, at the beginning of the evening. Councillor Greenwald will go first. Thank you. First of all, thank you all for coming. Thank you to the Keen Sentinel, Jim, George, for being here. This really has turned out pretty well. I've never been really part of a debate like this, and you know, I want to applaud you as, as the audience for asking some good questions and, and for listening. I'm all about communicating, and I want to hear, and I think that really was the answer to this. I really wish that this evening was not called a debate. It's a forum. It's an exchange of ideas. I listen to George. I learn from George. I listen to you, I learn from you, and, and that is really what I'm all about. I'm in this because I love the city of Keene. I've been a city councilor, you've heard the story, now I want to step up to the role of mayor. Why? Because I want to communicate better with the councilors, with the community, and the surrounding towns and the state. We, we can do better and we will do better. We are moving forward. Don't forget the past. We have some really, really good planning and good things that have been done and I, I know it. I, I've lived it. Basically, I just want to serve you. That's it. I, I put in my uh, two years. I'll do my job. And I'm going to uh, make a, a promise that I'm going to work hard with the 15 city councilors to pretty likely groom the next mayor, committee chairman, to work, work forward to serve the city of Keene better, because I think that they're, they're really uh, the ones that do it. The mayor is just there, coordinating everything, and I'll do the best I can for you. That's all I could say. I'm just being really sincere. I'm in it for you, and that's all there is. Thank you. We're in an important time in Keene's history where we really are going to either choose for a change of direction, a bit of a new way of doing things. We're going to go after those opportunities that are calling to us. Think about the number of people that are working from home or flexible hours today compared to 10 years ago. It's exponentially more. 10 years from now, it's going to be exponentially more than it is today. These are important opportunities for us that we need to seize. If we're going to keep Keene the economically vibrant, attractive place that we all know it is. I chose Keene. My family's here. My company's here. I'm invested in this community. And I want to make sure that it thrives. So I'm going to work hard on a bunch of different levels. If I had to, to, to break it down to three, housing, number one, stabilizing the tax rate, and then making sure that we're focusing on economic development and workforce development. And a big component of workforce development is embracing diversity and inclusion. We have to do that. We have to do that for the city of Keene's benefit, but also for Keene State College. As Keene State College reaches out and tries to get um, into new markets and attract new people to Keene, we need to be ready for them. That's what it's about. And I would just say that the tools and people and way of doing things that have gotten us here are great. Keene's a great place to live. But those same tools, people, and way of doing things are not going to get us where we need to go. Thank you. Thank you. Our program has run its course. I thank the candidates for their initiative in campaigning for the position of mayor and for presenting themselves to this forum. I thank our panelists and I thank you and the audience. Again, I thank Keene State College for making this hall available. On leaving the hall, you'll find refreshments in the lobby where for 30 minutes, the Sentinel invites you to mingle and discuss what you've heard tonight. And also a reminder to drop off your um, uh, questionnaires. There's a box out there waiting for you. With that, thank you very much. Have a good night. <laughs>